Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this webinar. I'm going to be talking today. I'm Michael Daniel with, with the Cyber Threat Alliance, and I'll be talking today with uh, Matt Wachinski from Cisco's Talos, uh, Dor from Checkpoint, and uh, Joe Chen from Broadcom Semantic, uh, all of whom are longtime uh, supporters and members of the Cyber Threat Alliance. So we're very excited to have uh, have all of you here. Um, so thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, I thought maybe we could just jump right into uh, the discussion. You know, today's topic, we're going to be talking about, you know, striking it rich, how to actually make cyber threat intelligence sharing uh, work uh, for your company and what the benefits are that you can uh, get out of it. So maybe I'll just start with uh, an opening question um, about you know, we always hear about cyber threat intelligence sharing, um, and you know, almost everybody agrees that it's useful and good, and it's something that we should do. But um, what should cybersecurity companies expect um, out of threat intelligence sharing when they when they start doing that with their peers or colleagues? And may, Matt, maybe I'll just start with you, and we'll just go around. You know, I think uh, when we look at it from the perspective of uh, cybersecurity companies or intelligence vendors like ourselves, you know, for us, we're kind of at the upper echelon of what we can do with data. So we're looking for extended visibility into, you know, places of the Internet that we may not have good coverage of. Uh, we're looking for extended metadata or understanding of what an individual threat actor is up to. Uh, we're looking for complex indicators of like how an adversary moves through an individual network. And so I think, um, you know, when, when you're dealing with that type of data or that complexity of data, it may be very different than what your standard, you know, Fortune 1000, Fortune 2000 does with data every single day. So uh, when we look at it, it's really about that richness of context and how much more we can know about something when we only have, say, one or two pieces of the puzzle, we're looking to complete that puzzle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dorit, what about you? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm with you on the diversity of the data, on the uh, multiple point of views of the data. Um, I read I read the question a bit different in the sense that what should you expect also mean does it mean your goal from the kind of from the intelligence now we are in a very different aspect of security than than I met and uh, our goal is to run prevention at the customer side so to stop attacks so we on one hand we could use any intelligence that exists to calculate our prevention decisions and make sound decisions. But the question is, can I count on threat intelligence sharing as a way to do prevention? And the answer is, is mixed. Because I think one of the things about intelligence sharing is that you have to realize the source of this intelligence and what purpose it came to serve. So not because somebody is trying to uh, noise you, it would not necessarily be fitting prevention because maybe their purpose of digging this intelligence is, is, is different than our purpose. And so you have to be careful what you use, careful not in the sense that somebody is trying to damage you, but careful in understanding what was the purpose and what is it good for. Yeah, I guess I'll go next. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Oh, so, sorry, Michael, I'll let you complete that thought and I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. No, go ahead. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I think uh, intelligence sharing for, for bigger companies like us, um, there's a certain level of trust level, and, uh, and, and there's also a ton of validation, right? And our goal, and our goal also is very upfront on prevention, not just telling what happened afterwards, but we really want to just prevent the attack in the first place. Now, I think, uh, you know, for us, there's a level of trust of the input of that the uh, threat intel coming from, you know, from ads, from Cisco, from, from Checkpoint. Uh, and you know, in, in most cases, I, we are, you know, this, you know, again, people may even think this is kind of strange, like com competitors get together. But, you know, in most cases, our big customers have all of us co-deployed and us working together only protects them a lot more. And uh, by us sharing that intelligence, you know, kind of for the customers, we're kind of orchestrating that, that real-timeness, you know, for our customers, and deploy them to all the control points that we can possibly deploy them to. 
you know, I, I think our customers win. So that's how that's how we uh, view intelligence sharing uh, you know, at, at a very uh, high level. Yeah, I think that last point's a, a really good point there, Joe. You know, the uh, the more places we can get protection, uh, the better off we can be for our customers, the better off we can stop an individual threat. Because you know, if you can stop it on the network and on the endpoint and before it even gets to the email server or whatever, then you can cause yeah. a lot more damage to that adversary and their infrastructure if we all work together. That's right. That's right. And the fact that everyone brings its own vector of protection or its own time zones or type of customers or sources yeah. of this data is, is a plus in the complementary of the, of the data in, in its usage. Yeah, and I think that the, you know, obviously the, the different perspectives that all of you bring, that all the different CTA members bring, that's one of the reasons why, you know, CTA functions um, the way that it does um, and has been as effective uh, as it's been over the last few years. Um, but of course, you know, I, as, as I just said in a previous meeting today, you know, the, the cybersecurity landscape is littered with the dead carcasses of, you know, information sharing efforts, right? Um, and, you know, one of the questions that, that, um, that I have is given the utility that you get out of, out of sharing, you know, why does the reality often diverge from the expectations, right? Or the, why does reality diverge from uh, the ideal, uh, if you will? Um, mm -hmm. You know what what tends to make those those efforts go uh, go awry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe Joe, we can start with you this time. Uh, maybe I'll tell you what, what's been good about how CT is doing it. You know, instead of saying like you know the reasons why some other efforts have gone awry. Uh, I would say, I think we did it right, right? Like, you know, like we, uh, especially the founding members, we put money where our mouth is. We, we, we spent a lot of money <laughs> yeah. uh, the first couple of years. Like, you know, each company dumping a couple million bucks to make sure we, we, we uh, stood up a, a body, an entity where this thing is facilitated professionally, right? And we'll continue to recruit and make sure we, uh, you know, we, we, you know, this thing will uh, be able to sustain itself. Even without the four or five guys that help really get this thing going, I mean, this will, 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 will keep going on. Um, and two, I think it's the people, right? We also put we all all the big companies put our threat intel people together. It's not the business folks. So on a daily basis, they they have a common goal. So they're not really kind of thinking about businesses. They're thinking about protecting customers. So their their goals are aligned, uh, and we'll leave them be. So they're you know the, the intelligence sharing is it's a very fluid, right? Now, personally, I'll share an experience there because of this. I got to meet with Matt. There, there, there's one, at least one instance where I called him midnight, you know, East Coast time. I was like, I, I, I need some help. And he's answering my call. And I think we really helped create quite a few edges in this type of, you know, connections at many levels. And, and, and you know, those are the, the side effects of, of, of this. And, and, you know, I think that's why it works. Yeah, go ahead, Dorian. Yeah, I think that it's also important to have an agreed um, agenda to how much gets shared. And so people don't stay behind and people know they should be uh, keeping going. So even though we came all together and we have the same interest, I think the fact that uh, there is kind of measurement of that, that doesn't let it slip just because of uh, forgetting, changing, people moving around, uh, makes it going. And then on top of this, there are the other, which I think more interesting adventures, such as common tasks to do something, common tasks to address a problem, common tasks to uh, take down somebody, um, where you, you get much deeper into the data. So you get a better linkage and you get to appreciate each other by working together. So uh, the fact that the regular operation doesn't fall apart because it's kind of being watched and you you get a reminder that uh, you have to you have to watch watch your behavior and then on top of that the value add that you get not just from the intelligence but from the extra activity and you really become a community to do something together yeah. yep I, uh, I I agree with all of those points, you know, and I think the, the the big one is what Joe said, which is when you have the will 
and the capability to do something, it, you can be a lot more successful at it. And so, you know, with this organization, we have the will, we put our money where our mouse was, we built an organization, um, and then we turned it over to all the smart people who are actually capable of doing something. And, you know, that's the threat researchers and the guys that are writing protections and the guys that are threat hunting the actors that are out there. Um, and by allowing them to share information amongst themselves, you know, they become much more successful at that task. Uh, and they're able to, to track that threat at its fullest and then build the correct protections for all of our products and services. And so it's really that will and capability that makes it successful. I'm, I'm fond of pointing out that, you know, I think one of the underlying assumptions that a lot of people make about intelligence sharing is that it should be easy, that if you just connect up the, if you just connect up the pipes that, uh, the information will flow. Um, and, you know, it turns out that that's, that's not right. Um, in fact, information sharing takes and doing it, doing it well, right. Doing it consistently, uh, over time actually takes a lot of, takes a lot of work. It's hard. And so Joe, I would add, so it, I mean, it definitely takes money, right. You had to put resources against it, but you also had to put people's time against mm -hmm. it. And to Dorit's point, they have to pay attention to it. Right. And then what we've all been talking about here is that ultimately over time we build up that trust. Right. So you've got those four factors that are in there, that time, attention, money and trust in order to actually make that work. And if you think that you're going to be able to do effective threat intelligence sharing on the cheap, I think that's that's cheap in any of those dimensions. Right. Um, then I think you're you're kind of setting yourself up for uh, for disappointment. Uh, with with the results because it really takes that and you have to sustain it over time. Um, you know, it's not a one and done, uh, one and done sort of thing. And yeah. I think that's those, 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 that is an underappreciated element in what happens um, in a lot of information sharing organizations. And I think, or even just, you know, efforts. Um, I mean, and sort of building along those, those lines, I mean, you know, if you were advising, um, whether it's another cybersecurity company or, you know, a large enterprise that was looking to get into, you know, more sharing relationships, um, what, what would you advise them to do? What are some of the common pitfalls that you've seen organizations make where they, so that they don't get as much value out of sharing as they could? Um, you know, what, what are some of those things to avoid? Dort, we can start with you on this one. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to return to to the thing of kind of trust the common sources and the common goal to be similar. So if there are very uneven relationship, they may not hold for a long time. So it depends. You have to create some equilibrium where everybody agrees on kind of what are the, the grounds and what's minimal to share. But I think it adds value when you share more. So one of the things we share in the uh, Alliance uh, is, is we share our publications before we go public, for example. Mm -hmm. so we have a common learning. So there is, there is more exposure than, than just the sharing that create the further trust. But I, the best line is to have a, an agreed set of rules and an agreed set of um, metrics that have to be uh, that have to to run. As I said, I think it would fall apart without it. But uh, um, I think that the value add has to be has to be there, and you have to understand that from the extra activity you get also something that is that is valuable. In this case, it's really the top vendors in the market. So you get a very high value to begin with uh, if you started in kind of equal, equal grounds. And then you, on top of that, get all the extra research and information. Yeah, yeah I, think to, I think to be really simplistic about it, right, data, data has value. It has, a, it has a monetary, you know, dollar value associated with it. And so if you're trading it with other organizations, you have to be getting 
the requisite value back out of it, of, of those relationships. And so, you know, trust is super important, right? Like if you can't trust how the information is going to be used or where it's going to be used, that's a, that's an important aspect. Um, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, we're moving dollars around and we're calling it Intel. Uh, and so you got to be able to extract that value on your side. So it's about the, it's about the money. <laughs> Yeah, it's not the so obvious portion of when we say threat intel. I think we have the automated intel sharing stuff, right? That 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 that, that metric we publish, uh, Neil Neil uh, published on the annual basis. You know, I know for for us, we we try to pump in you know uh, half a million whatever you know, observables a, a month, uh, and try to. We, we, I think we're processing from from CTA in multiple millions of uh, observables on a monthly basis. And, you know, there's value. We, we look at it. It's, a, it's as good, if not better than other commercial feeds we were also subscribed to. You know, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And it comes with, in, with contextual ordering, right? Um, and, and something else is really wonderful that people do not know about is the, it's the, the low volume, high impact sharing, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, like you know, last year, you know, I, I think not once have we, I've, I've observed over the last two years when we have that early share of the really high impact stuff, you know, whether it's a whistle locker coming from Symantec or Dragonfly coming from Symantec or the Cisco, uh, and I'm blanking out, uh, Matt, what was, it, what was the first thing you guys shared uh, from Cisco? Oh, was it a limited uh, VPN, or was like, oh, VPN filter? Yep. A VPN filter. There you go. I, I, I think there's not a single time where I think someone said, I have an embargo on this. Do not talk about it until like, you know, you know, we, we let that company, we've always led the company to break news for the wonderful work they do. But at the same time, next day, like all the companies are ready to go, right? Ready to kind of, you know, enrich it with their own stuff and be able to kind of tell their customers about it. So you know, that, that was, uh, that was trust in action. The other uh, thing yeah. I want to put into this. So some people, uh, Talk about sharing, and uh, and Joe touched on this. Talk about sharing as a sharing of an IOC, and I think you have to add the context and just the IOC. Okay, you know, you could give me a hash of something, but let's go. Be, let's go above it. Let's let's try to understand what what else do I know about it, and not just be very limited in the in the value of the. Yeah. Here is an indicator. Yeah, and I think one of the other things that I find so interesting uh, in this area, and Dorit, it's something that you said about you know really making sure that your um, your goals are aligned, um, and that you've agreed on the on the rules and metrics to begin with. Um, when when I look at how you know how sharing has evolved over the last you know decade or so i think that's really become one of the one of the key points is i think there was sort of this idea early on that if we that if you just shared that it would be obvious how the that you know it was obvious where that value would go it's obvious what the goal was and it was obvious you know uh what the rules and metrics should be and i think one of the realizations was that it was in fact not obvious right and that we needed to in the case of CTA, we needed to write down um, what those rules and metrics were, um, and then so that everybody could agree on them, and then actually hold people to them, right, and and measure that and do that over time consistently, and then learn from it. Um, and I think the that was a pretty big step forward, um, and it's something that I've seen a lot of other I've seen a lot of interest in from other people about you know sort of. Um, and the questions that I often get about CTA are, you know, I very rarely get questions about, I mean, as cool as our technology is, right, as, as well as Magellan works, I don't get a lot of te- questions about that. What I get questions about are are the business rules, right, um, and the underlying agreements that all of you had to make in order to actually get there. Um, and to me, that's one of the more telling things is that this is, as much about the sure the tech, I mean the technology is absolutely critical to making the automated sharing work. For example, we couldn't do it without that. But that's that's only part of the picture. And I think that was some of what we've been alluding to here is that it's not just about the 
the underlying technology that's used, but it's also about those business rules, about the processes that are put in place. And that's an underappreciated part of being able to extract the value that you want um, out of those kinds of uh, sharing activities. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and so I think, you know, if there were, again, sort of going back to some of the other, you know, sharing efforts that you've all been part of over the years, you know, are there, is there, um, are there things that you wish, you know, like, again, sort of in this, you know, if you're giving advice to somebody who is starting to join one of these things, you know, maybe a new startup cybersecurity company, you know, what do you wish those organizations would do when they go to share threat intelligence with others? Um, if you're sort of giving best practices for how to be a good contributor to the community, what would you, what would you say on that score? Matt, we can, we can start with you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go back to kind of like the early days of CTA when, when we created the bylaws and incorporated, uh, the, you know, the, the group, uh, that was like eight, almost 12 months worth of, of legal work to get everything in place, determine how we should set up the organization how the members would contribute, uh, what they would contribute, when it needs to be contributed, how would we rate members you know, as being a success, um, and how would we rate our organization as a whole as being successful. And you know, do, being able to set up all that ground rule infrastructure uh, makes it a, a whole lot easier for expectations to be met across the board and everybody to truly understand what problem we're trying to solve, how we're trying to solve it, um, and with what, and what we can expect of each of the members of the organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the biggest thing I can kind of take away from that is you got to do the groundwork. Don't just be like, hey, I want to share a bunch of data, and, like, we're going to go magically solve some problem. Uh, that only works for, you know, limited point problems. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to do something that's sustainable, you got to do the, uh, the business work up front to make sure that uh, you can accomplish that goal over time. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, one of the question is always what else to aspire to share. So for example, if, if I take another angle on your question, then I would think that at some point we should kind of take a, a common look on XDR and how we see kind of events across kind of how we go from the language that each of us have to a common language of kind of an XDR and, re and response to, to an action uh, and and uh, and how do we share things within this context that enables people to kind of respond mm -hmm. somehow. I'm not saying it's easy but you, you said what if somebody made something new then this would be uh, some uh, some aspiration to have into the future, so mm. something more, uh, 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 more in-depth correlation between the elements. Uh, but that would be also harder to do. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure that everyone is is willing to now get to spend all the energy on this. But uh, I think this would have been valuable uh, addition. For me, like the small company is a no-brainer. You gotta join this. Although you have to to uh, to to pay to be in uh, be the what, what's the lowest level called now, Michael? I can't remember. Uh, contributing. That's only, only like right? twenty five thousand a year. So. Twenty five thousand. Yeah, I think it's really a no-brainer. You get to right on top of all this great intel for twenty five thousand dollars, and you get to meet quite a few you know folks in the industry. You get to you know, get to work together. Uh, the big companies already already pay the, for the bill. You know to get this thing set up. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, my, I guess okay, if I say, say something controversial, we can edit this out later, right, Michael? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I think my disappointment is more with the larger companies and maybe not the small companies. Like, I, just watching the team, uh, you know, watching the team growing at 25% this year, awesome. Good job, Michael and team. But watching some of the big names in the company obviously have great data to share, have yet to really be collaborate and join this something that's real instead of just set up a forum and there's no real sharing going on. It almost marginalized what's real, what's practical, what's real sharing that's that's actually happening through CTA, right? And some of the larger companies have yet to join. It makes me it makes me like you know kind of channeling my my uh, my, my friend Rick Howard who will say like, hey, you have not joined the CTA, and why not? Why haven't you have, have you joined? Right? It's it's, it's uh, you know it's a uh, 
Sorry, I'm arguing with Rick so much. It kind of started to, he started to rub off on me. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's, you got to think a little larger. So, like, so I think there was also some, some, cons- uh, con- uh, some reservation around, like, possible, just, you know, there's, there's other hidden agenda with this. Like, there's not. Like, if there's one, there's one, I've yet to see it. This is really just about sharing intel. So I think, you know, people with good stuff it has to be part of this. So, uh, so that's kind of my takeaway, Michael. Yeah, no, and, and it, thank you. Thank you for the plug. The, um, you know, I think the, you know, the work that we've, that we've done uh, to try to um, learn the lessons from sharing. I mean, I think the other piece for me that's been very important is, you know, we've, we're not the same organization we were four years ago, right? We've changed, we've grown, we've adapted, we've learned from what's been happening, right? We take new ideas from all of you and incorporate them into what we're doing. And we've grown with um, how, uh, how the industry is changing and how the threat landscape is changing. And I think that's really important too, um, that it can't, you know, it can't be static. Um, that it, it, you know, any of these sharing efforts have to, you know, grow and change in order for them to continue providing value to, uh, in order to continue, you know, providing value to the companies. Um, you know, I think the, um, if there's any, just for anybody that's actually logged in, you know, live watching us, um, we do have a Q and a function and you can drop a you know question in the Q and a, uh, and we'll try to uh, get to it in the, in the time that we have left. You know, one, we've been talking a lot about the sort of private sector to private sector work. And that's where, you know, CTA's, you know, core, core mission is. But of course, a big player in the cybersecurity environment are governments. Um, and, you know, the, and different governments have different approaches to this. Um, you know, and, and all of you are, you know, work with companies that have operations, you know, all over the world. I mean, Dora, your head, you know, Checkpoint is headquartered in, in Israel, mm-hmm. um, but you operate globally. Same thing is true for Symantec and for, you know, Cisco Talos. And sort of how do you see, um, how do you see governments fitting into these kinds of uh, sharing arrangements? And, and if you could make some improvements in that, what would it, what would it be? Anybody well, can. we're coming into another election in Israel, so by the time we will figure out who's the prime minister. No, but joking. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the the problem there is uh, we we talked about equilibrium, and I think many of them would like to share what they like to share and would like to accept all the rest. So there is kind of inequality by nature. Um, and so I'm not sure that they are kind of equal participants in any of these, but they could be a valuable participant. So if they are willing to contribute, even if what they contribute is skewed, it may be worthwhile. So we talked about kind of theoretical monetization of the intelligence. So if we could put a price to it, we could measure how much they pay back and if they pay back enough they they could play but the fear is that it's not always same same in terms of playing back just because they are kind of protective of their own data i'm not sure i would know to change it by nature but i think uh, it's a, an opportunity to to convince them to evolve in that sense I think there's two really good places uh, that, you know, organizations like CISA and uh, a number of other, you know, organizations across the globe have done a a good job in, which are really amplification of message when bad things are happening and uh, vetting and consolidating recommendations and IOCs into an approved list. So if, if we go and look at events like solar wind, uh, and the latest stuff that's going on with Exchange. You know, CISA has done a, a pretty amazing job of getting all of the information in one place, getting it out to lots and lots of people so that they understand what the threat is, how it works, and why it's important. 
Uh, and they've done a very good job of essentially, you know, cultivating the list and making sure that it's correct of all the IOCs that are out there so that the, the information is, is good, it's vetted, it's trusted. Um, would we love to see, you know, governments share more data? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure they've got some really great stuff. I'm sure it would help all of us. Uh, but if they can't do that in the short term, the best thing they could do is amplify our voices um, and validate data and intelligence so that it comes from a trusted source and people know where to get it. Yeah. Uh, uh, two on sharing, I think you know we we so many many of the government entities are also our customers. We, we certainly follow you know their desire to sh what to share, what not to share. It's certain things marked to not share as as private. You know we follow those rules and those you know so we're compliant. Um, and then on the on on the government to private sector sharing, I think you know I hope government agencies uh, around the world sees us as an extension of infrastructure. Anything that's shared with us, we, there's a better chance of getting it deployed rapidly to, uh, to infrastructure they care about. If anything, we learned from last year, I think you said uh, there's a, the, the, the private and public infrastructure is really blurry, right? So, you know, do you call, uh, you know, do you call Netflix or Amazon or, you know, these companies, are they critical infrastructure? Maybe they are. You know, if, if we didn't have delivery to our, you know, to our home last year, like we would be in trouble. And, uh, and you know, these are provide protecting our private sector businesses is almost as critical. So I, I think government could really use us as, uh, you know, as an extension, as an extension to protect, you know, uh, our, our critical infrastructure. And this goes not only to government, this goes to kind of, if they, if we take, take back the exchange example, and if uh, the exchange gets fixed, then it immediately gets, you know, in the wild, and if we could preempt and get a network of prevention up front, this would be a win. So this is just as a recent example, but every example that kind of gets patched could be uh, an example of preemptive security as well, where they could leverage us. Yeah, no, I think that the, you know, the, the, Interactions with government are are very complex, and sort of having been in you know been in government for many years myself, and sort of looked at it from that side, looking at it from from this side, um, you know, I think the the single biggest thing, right, is that uh, we come back to something we talked about at the very beginning that you have to align those goals and figure out where the where the relationship has some aligned goals because there are some places where they're just different. The business imperatives of a company protecting its customers and clients are sometimes different than the goals that governments have. Um, and, and that's not, that's not, neither one is better or worse than the other. They're just different. Um, and I think that, you know, if you build the relationships, knowing that if you go in having that as the foundation, then you're going to, you're, you're going to be able to extract a lot more value from the, from those relationships. I think the biggest change on the government side is is the is the realization, the knowledge that in fact you are going you you not just want to share with the private sector right and be engaged, but you actually need to, right? If you actually want to, to Joe, to your point, if you actually really want to protect that critical infrastructure, you need to be working with the private sector companies, right? And different governments have different approaches to this, but that's going to be true for you know all all governments around the world, um, I think. Um, to really have that, um, you know, have that, that, that mindset. Um, and the, I think the, the no, go ahead. Yeah. The, the same time, they, they're also in the conflict of should they block or should they track? Right. So the interest that we said we are for prevention and we want to stop the attacks is not always the same goal. So even at that, even if, if they know about bad something, it doesn't immediately translate to the same goal as we would use the data for. Sure. Sure. And I, I think the, you know, I think also talking about, Matt, your point about being able to get the word out to a large number of, of people, we've actually seen that, I think, with, like, the exchange vulnerabilities, right? The 
um, the need to really just use every possible communication channel to try to get to people because so many of the, so at this point, right. Um, after, especially after the first week, you know, the large enterprises that have huge dedicated IT and cybersecurity teams, they had all, they had all patched, right? But now we were to that portion of the the ecosystem where it's they're less capable, and some of whom aren't even paying attention, um, and not not because they're dumb, just because that's not their thing. They're trying to run another business, and they're not, you know, paying attention to the the cybersecurity news, and so. Um, I think that your point about using government in that sense to leverage that communication vehicle to reach audiences that otherwise wouldn't be paying attention is really, really important. Um, Because otherwise we just can't get to all the pieces of the ecosystem. Oh, I completely agree, Michael. The more voices you have out there, the better. You know, the more people that are informed, the better. Uh, And, you know, that allows people to go patch so that, you know, that, that one guy with that one exchange server who's, a, you know, just an IT admin, doesn't know much about it. Hopefully he patches his stuff so that that box isn't used to attack one of somebody else, right? Right. And, and until we can get that word out to everybody and they go update all their stuff, you're still never fully protected with, you know, all the security stuff that you can put out there until you put that patch on there. So the more voice, the better. So as we, you know, bring this... Uh, discussion to a close, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to to chat. What what's kind of your your top two points that you would like to to convey, kind of on this idea of how you extract value from shared threat intelligence? What are what what would you want to leave our you know our intrepid listeners um, with? So, Matt, I'll, I'll start with you. I'm going to go with, uh, you know, something Joe said to start, you know, we, I'd really like to see some of the other companies that are out there join the CTA uh, and come join us, help protect our, all our, our mutual customers, right. And help shut down some of these bad guys. And to, to do that, you have to join a active organization who is working uh, in that realm. You know, and the, the second one I would say is um, even Every company can participate in CTA in some way. Uh, You have valuable insight into portions of the world that even big guys like myself or the others that are on this call may not be able to see every day. So come join us. Come help us track down these bad guys. Help us uh, protect customers. Help us keep the world safe. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Joe. Ah, I mean, Matt said what I was going to say. So <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I'll, I'll do a wish list, right? I'll say, I'll say, you know, Michael. I think uh, with the current administration and then all the all the, the experience from the last four or five years, I hope you uh, you bring a lot of the, the the new learnings over to uh, to the government side, um, and uh, you know, help us grow that way. And then, my well, what I'm betting on is, you know, I think we already really invest in CTA, and then just you know, if you come, you, you continue to grow at twenty five percent a year. I, you know, I, uh, we all stand to benefit, you know, just uh, have uh, better intel. So I'm just counting you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but no pressure or anything. No, that, no that's pressure. good. Yeah. That's good. All right, Dorit, last word. Yeah, so I'll take uh, one that was mentioned in the sense of economy of scale. So we already have the agreements and the kind of honesty and the joint purpose. So if you are to share intelligence, at least share it with where there is already kind of a lot and functional kind of use of that intelligence. So I think I join uh, the other people in in inviting people to share on the how to leverage it. So that's the second point. I would say understand what each entity is sharing and why they are sharing this. And then you'd be able to use what they shared in in a good way. So... People bring the information from where they are in the way they uh, process the information. And so if you understand how the data was kind of just generally created and what is, uh, what is the kind of, what is it useful for? So you could use it for what is good and not get upset for what it's not good. So you shouldn't hammer information that was created for one purpose for not serving another purpose, but you should use it for the purpose it was built for. 
No, that's great. That's some really great, some really great insight. And as always, I very much appreciate uh, the working collaboration that we have uh, that we've uh, built over the years. Um, and you know, I very much look forward to when. Um, we might even be able to have one of these panels in person uh, again, as opposed right. to just having to do it virtually. So, um, well, I'll be uh, I'll be looking forward to that. But yeah, well, thank I you very much. Say, yeah, go ahead. I to say that we already share intelligence about the quality of vaccinations from Israel. So I think Israel <laughs> shared all its data with <laughs> Pfizer in trying to kind of get to high level of vaccination. <laughs> yes, we can only aspire to what Israel has already achieved here. The, uh, what, would you, we can only aspire in the United States to what you've already achieved in Israel. So um, we'll definitely be, uh, be looking for that. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, folks. And uh, we will be talking to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you.